Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and I would like to also thank you all for your patience. Could you please rise for the invocation? Yes. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, item 2.03, approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? All those in favor? Motion passes, seven zero zero. The next item is to establish the agenda order. Mrs. Birch. I move that we move agenda items 5.04 and 5.05 .05 to uh, appear before 5.01. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes, seven zero zero. The next item on the agenda is 2.05 recognitions. And we have no recognitions this evening, but I did want to mention that Mrs. Nally is away on travel tonight. We will now move on to school and community highlights, 2.06. Do any of my fellow board members have anything to share? Nobody. Dr. Olato, anything? Okay. 2.07, the CRASS report. Good evening, President Korbelek, Dr. Arlotto, and members of the board. My name is Jacob Horskam, and I'm a junior at North County High School and the new second vice president of the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. This year, the CRAS exec staff will be meeting at a biweekly basis, allowing us to keep our objectives in mind and maintain our focus. This will be essential as we plan for the year. We intend on taking a number of projects and initiatives in the school system and community. To kick off our community activism for the year, a group of students will be representing Krask and AACPS at the Walk to Defeat ALS in Baltimore on October 5th. As a way to represent ourselves as a student organization and showing that you can do more than just pour a bucket of ice water in your head, we are able to promote awareness on a large scale and we hope other student leadership organizations will follow us. Our first official Krask event will be, le will be a leadership retreat at Lindell Middle School on October 16th. At this time, we will gather students from all schools to help us determine the direction of our work. Among our object objectives, this year we hope to reinvigorate participation and enthusiasm toward the Cool Skills Challenge at the Polar Bear Plunge. We are also planning to update our election procedures to reflect our resources and technology that is available to us. Thank you for your opportunity to speak on behalf of the students of Anne County. We look forward to serving you for the next year. Next, we have item 2.08, the PTA report. Good evening, President Korbelak, Vice President Nally, members of the board, and Dr. Olato. I'm Pam Bukowski, President of the Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. On behalf of the AACC PTA, I would like to congratulate and welcome our new superintendent, Dr. Olato, and the student member of the board, Ms. Aisha Chaudhry. Looking forward, we know this will be a year of change, growth, and promise. It's a year of newness, new superintendent, new principals, new teachers, new classmates. And at several schools, PTA has taken on a whole new look in life. Highlighting one school, Hilltop Elementary, PTA President Leonard Maddox and Vice President Eric Swan spent a considerable amount of time volunteering at the school and coincidentally are the spouses of teachers at the school. These men are totally devoted to the students, staff, and administration of Hilltop. Such devotion is not unusual in the role of PTA, but Eric and his wife live in Howard County, and Eric chooses to give that rare and valuable commodity of time to Hilltop because he's committed to support the school where his wife teaches. Staff members Carol Donham and Kathy Dehaw have stepped up as treasurer and secretary. Again, when necessary, it's not unusual for principals to ask staff if they might be willing to step up to the plate and take on an executive position in the school PTA. 
I generally assume that said staff member likes and respects the principal enough to comply. In this case, there is certainly admiration and respect for Principal Louise DeJesu, but she didn't ask these two women to serve. They volunteered because they simply loved their school and the students that much. Hilltop Elementary School PTA is experiencing a sort of renewal, and we hope to see this occur with many of our local PTA units. In fulfilling its mission, PTA stands ready and willing to support our schools, engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Our first major event will be a general membership meeting Arts Council Showcase on Thursday, October 2nd at Marley Middle School from 5.30 to 8 o'clock. We hope that Board of Education members are able to join us for the evening. As always, PTA thanks you for these many opportunities to speak for every child, one voice. Thank you. Next, we'll have public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on an item not on today's agenda may offer testimony during this public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers will be allotted three minutes each, and the board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Student-specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. This time is intended for speakers to voice their opinion and not necessarily as a question and answer period. Speakers may pose questions, but answers will be counted toward the three-minute allotment. For the record, please give your name before speaking, and any handouts should be given to the board assistant. I'd like to call the first five people up to the podium, and I'd like to welcome Councilman Jerry Walker and Delegate Kathy Vitale, along with Jonathan Boniface, Shannon Hyland, and Wes Adams. Good evening, Dr. Arlato, Madam President, members of the board. Thank you for once again hosting our group from Crofton. I uh, did just want to start out by saying quickly that I appreciate uh, Dr. Arlato's invitation to tour a number of the schools at the start of the school year. We had an enjoyable time visiting a number of the schools in my district. Uh, Mr. Jackson accompanied us at one point, Ms. Brandenburg, uh, Mr. Benfer. So uh, we had some good, um, some good tours of the schools, so thank you for including me in that process. Um, but we are here once again tonight. Uh, I am here with uh, my folks from Crofton that I represent, um, asking you to continue to um, keep in front of you the issue of a Crofton High School. It's very important to our community. Um, and I also wanted to recognize this evening, also in support, in addition to the folks standing in purple, we have candidate um, for House of Delegates Sid Saab and candidate for House of Delegates um, Reverend uh, Green with us this evening as well. So we appreciate their attendance also. And of course, uh, Delegate Tally as well. So thank you all very much for your continued consideration. We'll continue to have discussions and uh, thank you for being patient and listening to us this evening. Thank you very much. I actually put a couple comments down because there were more than just one topic I wanted to breeze through if I might. First of all, Dr. Arlotto, congratulations as I conveyed upon you last year as we were walking across the stage that we were expecting great and wonderful things from you so far. So good. Um, I just wanted to do two things. One was <laughs> last year, <laughs> last year the, uh, the board made commentary uh, as we came to you and asked for your support in legislation before the House and Senate that discussed alternative financing. Whether we were talking about Crofton High School or we were talking about how to build other schools within Anne Arundel County, uh, I believe the comments or some of the comments that were made back then were that we didn't come to you soon enough and you didn't understand the legislation. So I did want to let you know that we're having additional legislation drafted and I will look forward to meeting with uh, Dr. Arlotto as well as the members of the board on that legislation. We still think it has a viable piece I think that there's a mechanism to address any of the concerns with MOE and the, the trusting, if you will, over those that are charged with doing the construction and those that are charged with paying the bill. But I think that there's a way to do that because obviously, as you know, you can look out behind me into the sea of purple and know that there's uh, at least one group that's interested in bringing a little uh, purple and white to the community and that would be Crofton High School. As I listen to the community members, and I know that Jonathan's gonna speak to you in a couple seconds about some very specific statistics they actually took me back a little bit and had me thinking a little bit about school sizes and learning environments and what was available for students. And I think that they're onto something, both in how they've carefully planned how you might redistrict, a nasty word, whether you're on your side or my side when, when people are talking about putting students in different schools, and they've really thought it out and have been 
promulgating a very good plan for both construction, participants, as well as who are the players that might get shifted from one school to the other. I thought about it in the following. I'm gonna ask that each one of you take some time in the next couple days to look up the Indiana Sheriff's Association. The Indiana Sheriff's Association put together a presentation that I came back from at the end of last week where they've created what is being um, dubbed as the safest school in America. So as you begin your work on new construction, I'd ask you to take a look at their presentation in both site and design. They've talked a lot about um, the unfortunate realities of active shooters and safety from both student perspective as well as administrative and have come up with a, uh, a mechanism or a means to create safe schools and would ask that you all would consider that once you've had a chance to look at it, my office is gonna forward to you the PowerPoints that we received to take a look at that because I think it's worthwhile to, um, to see how other jurisdictions are putting things together and at a cost that's tolerable. Uh, the last thing that I just wanted to say really quick was I'm really looking forward to meeting with the new CRASC students. They've uh, approached our offices again. They're putting together their own agenda and the opportunity to work with some really exceptional future leaders is something that is, uh, it's really exciting. These kids are out of the box thinkers on a lot of different problems and have come up with solutions and I hope that you all, as they present their issues, uh, will give them good uh, opportunities to present and good consideration. So thank you for your evening, thank you for your time, and uh, have a very good school year. Good evening, Superintendent Arlotto, President Korbelak, and members of the board. My name is Jonathan Boniface. I'm the lead organizer of Build Crofton High School and a representative of the diverse community of Crofton. I stress diverse because I think too often Crofton is not recognized for its diversity. As the lead coordinator of the Crofton Meadows Elementary School Watchdog Program, I often spend time in the school volunteering. On my watchdog days, I've heard as many as five different languages being spoken at recess. Spanish, Portuguese, French, Japanese, and of course English. And that was all in just a first grade recess. If any of you on this board are un under the impression that Crofton is just a bunch of well-off people that all look alike, I ask you to take a day off work and shadow me as I volunteer a full day at Crofton Meadows Elementary. You will see what I see, a richness of diversity and students whose parents come from all walks of life. Students who belong to a community that is lacking adequate high school facilities. Students who are split up to and sent to schools in other communities schools that are quickly overcrowding. The state of Maryland requires you to submit an educational facilities master plan each year, and one of the mandatory elements of that plan are the 10-year enrollment projections. That data is the data we use when Build Crofton High School speaks of the capacity problem we are facing in our high schools. The data shows nine of 12 schools are, um, are over 100% capacity and a 10th at 98% capacity in the year 2023. Yet you insist that an update to the 2006 MGT study showing the need for an additional high school is the only way you will be convinced that there is a capacity problem or that an additional high school will even be needed. This board has you know, said it's a data-driven board. Do you not trust the data AACPS provides you? Should the state of Maryland trust the data in the Educational Facilities Master Plan um, that you provide them? Build Crofton High School trusts it. The community of Crofton trusts it and our politicians trust it. Is there a reason we shouldn't? Is there something we are missing? Waiting until the updated MGT study in 2016 tells us, tells you what your own data has told you for the past few years is unwise. Simple logic says you don't trade in your old school bus for a shiny new bus of the same size because you ran out of seats. You buy a second bus. And spending 339 million on the old mill complex before addressing the capacity problem is just not right. Where is the logic in that? We hope it is something the IAC, the state, our county executive, and the county council will put a stop to. And stopping this, that mistake is something this father thinks is necessary for the future of not just Crofton, but all of Anne Arundel County on its journey to greatness. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shannon Hyland. I am one of the organizers of Bill Crofton High School and a mother of two Crofton children. 
When we testify here, something we have done often over the past year, we ta tout the benefits of a Crofton High School. In our minds, it seems that there's no question that there is a need for a Crofton High School. We see our students traveling nearby Odenton and not so nearby Edgewater. The first week of school, there were reports of bus riders sitting in the aisles because buses were overcrowded. After two years of researching data to prove the need for a Crofton High School, we have come to the realization that Anne Arundel County needs a Crofton High School just as much as our own town. Anne Arundel County is losing far too many high wage earners at Fort Meade, NSA, and the U.S. Cyber Command to the nearby Howard County. When, when, they, when they go, the income from their revenue, excuse me, their income goes. The, let me stop. <laughs> With them goes the in, income tax revenue, excuse me. And now we're looking at projections for the year 2023 that show that nine schools out of the 12 are going to be over 100% capacity and one being the 10th being at 98%. That is 1,400 students without seats, 1,000 of those from Meade, Arundel, and South River. You can only cram so many students into a classroom, and schools that are busting at the seams end up breaking at the seams. We all know increased class sizes <clears throat> hurt the students with many slipping between the cracks, causing the achievement gap you are trying so desperately to close to grow even wider. This does not appear to be great, a great step in achieving the journey to greatness. Larger classes cause teachers to flee in search of better <coughs> teaching conditions as well as better pay in nearby counties. They've, they've already started leaving conditions as conditions to find better pay. We know this because we sat among those teachers at last spring as they testified before the county council. Some of them to the point of tears. A Crofton High School is a solution, is not a solution to every problem, but is a solution to the approaching capacity problem. It's a ripple effect through the, throughout the county. Meade, Arundel, South River, and Annapolis High Schools get some breathing space in both the classrooms and the halls. It will increase property values in turn in increasing revenue from property taxes that could be used to finally increase the school system budget. We have heard you clearly w say that Old Mill is waiting to be replaced. And we could say that the same for Crofton. We have been waiting patiently since taken off your list in the 1990s. Thank you, we Jane. understand the need for Crofton High School. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Olato, President Korbelak. My name is Wes Adams. Um, many of you might know me as the candidate for state's attorney here in Anne Arundel County. I'm the chief homicide prosecutor in Prince George's County. And the reason why I'm standing here with Crofton High School is because in my job, what I know is that as we lose kids due to overcrowding and being marginalized from larger schools, they end up coming across my desk. And that's just not what we need. The thing that I see as most important is with only 12 high schools in Anne Arundel County, you have kids, you only have 12 football teams, you only have 12 chess clubs, 12 marching bands. There's only so many after school activities that could be provided for kids. More importantly, with our classes being overcrowded, there's only so many teachers that we can provide for our students. We need another high school. We actually probably need a few more. Our high schools are overcrowded. With that overcrowding means our kids are being marginalized, they're being left out of activities, and when they're left out of activities, they're only left to, to act on their own. They're kids. When they act on their own, they get in trouble. When they start down that path, it's hard to change them. So as a person who's dedicated their life and their career to being a professional crime fighter and to solving these problems, one of the places that we can start is right with you guys. You have an impact on what happens to our children going forward from today. One of the ways that we can change that is to build a Crofton High School. Eight years ago, I stood before you guys and before the county council to build a Severna Park High School when they were increasing the class sizes for, the, for Benfield Elementary, where my kids have gone through. It's the same thing. We're overcrowded. We have too many kids. 
Not enough teachers, not enough schools, not enough things for them to do. And I'm asking you today, as a, as a crime fighter, to look outside of the box of not just simply Board of Education matters, but to see how it affects our entire community. That is what's important to all of us. So I am asking you to get Crofton High School built. It's a simple thing. Please make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. The next five I have Liv, Liz Dodson, uh, Laura Berrios, Steve Miller, Mickey Emanuel, and Janet Norman. Good evening to the board. Um, my name is Laura Berrios, and I'm speaking on behalf of the SAAC Unit 4 members. Over the last six years, Unit 4 members have only had a few small raises. Many of us have had part-time jobs to keep up with inflation. Unit 4 staff are an important um, role to the school system. We are not just secretaries and assistants. As you will hear, we are the foundation of the school system. We make it possible for our teachers to teach. Support staff have duties in the parking lot and throughout the building to make sure children are getting safely to class. We make sure the building is secure at arrival, dismissal, and throughout the day. Support staff is also part of the emergency team and are trained for any crisis situation that may arise, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, search helicopters, um, and, and crises like when 9-11 happened. As you know, we have been through some of these situations and we have kept our students safe and calm. We are also trained for other crisis situations such as intruders who wish to harm our children. We stand at the doors and watch for anyone that may not uh, belong at our school and we quickly go into action when there is a problem. We are responsible for the safety of our school and students. The secretaries check in people that are coming into our buildings they use Raptor to make sure that visitors are not child sex offenders. And secretaries are the first line of defense if the com computer shows that a visitor is an offender. Sometimes it is necessary to keep students safe during domestic issues. And we make sure that the child is protected from the non-custodial parent. While the secretary is de dealing with an irate parent, a t teacher is somewhere in the building making sure a child is safe. Hello, my name is Liz Dotson, president of SAAC. I am here with Laura and will continue where she left off. We are a part of a, of a team for students that have behavior interventions and we implement them. Our instruction, instructional assistants and our other unit four employees are reteaching the curriculum daily, not just to students with accommodations, but also to general education students. Many of our support staff have specialized training so that we can keep children with behavior issues safe. We care for our children that are sick or discreetly help children that have accidents. We are also observing possible bullying situations or help children that don't fit in to make friends. We do all this while still doing reading intervention groups to help students who are behind planning lessons and organizing the classrooms. <coughs> we have many parents trying to put their children from different counties into our schools and we are usually the ones to figure out that the student is out of area. Even though we work and are paid for 10 months per year, most of our spare <coughs> Most of, our, most of us spend our summers working in summer school, working at another job, or taking classes to further our education. Our duties and responsibilities have increased <coughs> dramatically over the years. The last increase received was negotiated due to rising health care costs, retirement contributions, and tax deductions. Most of us have had reductions in our take-home pay yet we still remain loyal to our students, teachers, administrators, and Board of Education. 
With all this said, we are here during all this and so much more so that our teachers can teach. So isn't it time that you give the support staff, the foundations of Anne Arundel County Public School, the raises that we more than well deserve so our teachers can teach. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Miller, and I'm here representing parents of our neighborhood, Deep Creek Village, whose children proudly attend Broadneck Elementary School. We are asking for your help in getting the Transportation Division of Anne Arundel County Public Schools to act on our request to relocate a bus stop from the corner of Belle Reve Drive and Quaker Ridge to Belle Reve Drive and Pennington Lane North, a distance of about 200 feet. On August 4th, a certified letter was delivered to the Supervisor of Transportation asking to relocate the bus stop for four reasons. To improve safety, provide shelter, comply with parking rules, and to ensure fairness for everyone. The current location was selected before our new community of 110 townhouses and single-family homes was fully built. There are 22 children who now utilize this bus stop all but three of them leave, live in Deep Creek Village. The current bus stop is just below the crest of a hill on Belle Reve Drive in a 30 mile per hour speed zone, but many vehicles travel faster than this. We believe moving the bus stop to Pennington Lane North, which is almost at the bottom of the hill, would give a better view of the bus stop and more reaction time for both directions of traffic. Another reason for moving the bus stop is to provide limited shelter for the children in adverse weather. Deep Creek Village has a large covered gazebo at the entrance to the community. There is no shelter at the current bus stop. Parents who might drive their children to the bus stop in the morning have no place to park on Belle Reve Drive. Parking is prohibited between the hours of 6 to 9 a.m. There are no parking restrictions on Pennington Lane. It's a public right-of-way. As I previously mentioned, the location of the bus stop was determined before the number and location of new children attending Broadneck Elementary School was known. We provided the Transportation Division with a map showing where the children using the current bus stop live and why relocating the bus stop, even just 200 feet, is fair for everyone. I met with a supervisor on August 18th and was told that we had to provide proof of unanimous consent of all parents to relocate the bus stop. Although we did not find any such requirement in the school bus scheduling and routing regulation, we nevertheless provided information packages to every parent and an envelope addressed to the Transportation Division so they could mail in their approval or disapproval forms individually. We know that responses from 13 of the 16 parents were delivered on September 4th. We feel that we have engaged with the transportation officials in a civil and constructive manner. Twice we have invited the supervisor to survey the proposed site together without receiving any acknowledgement. No written responses have been received on any of our emails or letters. Even allowing for the multitude of bus related issues associated with the startup of the new school year, we find the unresponsive attitude of the office to be frustrating and uncharacteristic of service we have experienced from other county organizations. We regret having to use the board's time for this administrative matter. However, we hope that by presenting our issue here tonight, someone will help open the lines of communications so that we can obtain a timely and objective response to our request. Thank you very much for your time and attention and for your dedicated support to our teachers, parents, and children. Greetings, President Korbelak, Superintendent Arlotto, and members of the board. For the record, my name is Mickey Emanuel. I have grandchildren in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Madam President, you are aware that I've testified before this board several times in the last year, urging it to provide the wisdom and courage necessary to support the OCR agreement. For those who are not aware, a community group member, a community, a group of community members filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education in 2004, alleging racial disparities in education in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Using Anne Arundel County Public Schools' own data, the U.S. Department of Education recommended mediation and referred the case to the U.S. Department of Justice. Then Anne Arundel County Public Schools Superintendent Dr. Eric Smith requested mediation in lieu of sanctions, which the community agreed to. In September of 2005, the Department of Justice mediated the OCR agreement. As we get underway with a new school year, 
uh, I would like to restate a few points that I offered in testimony before this board in the past. I mentioned that parents and the community need to do more to address the issues facing our children. This acknowledgement does not minimize the school system's fiduciary responsibilities. I also testified that I respect the hard work and commitment the vast majority of Anne Arundel County Public Schools employees demonstrate on a daily basis. As a reminder, I also said that being a leader requires more than having the wisdom that you pray for in your invocation. It requires having the courage to act confidently on that wisdom once it is revealed to you. In May, I mentioned that on April 21st, 2014, County Councilman Gerald Jones shared the results of a study which indicate that it is in Anne Arundel County's economic best interest for Anne Arundel County Public Schools to eliminate the achievement gap. The adoption of Resolution 1314 elevates the visibility of the county's achievement gap. It is critical that this board provide the leadership the governor has charged you with to produce the win-win our county needs and deserves with all deliberate speed. On June 4, 2014, Mr. Webb chastised the community for seven minutes during a diatribe that reminded me of something my commander used to say when I was in the Air Force, which was that an optimist is someone who tells you to cheer up when things are going their way. Madam President, my testimony before this board may seem contentious at times to some people. Most people are not aware that I received my second Community Engagement Award from Anne County Public Schools on May 22nd of this year. The awards were given to me for the many years I've dedicated to volunteering on behalf of and providing the voice for students and parents who otherwise would not have a voice before this school system. In closing, I'm troubled when I contemplate that 10 years has not been enough time to eliminate the achievement gap and how many more students affected by the achievement gap will graduate or drop out of Anne Arundel County Public Schools before the achievement gap is eliminated. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, uh, Mr. Superintendent and the board, uh, my name is Janet Norman. I'm a member of the Annapolis Middle School PTSA, Annapolis High School PTA, Annapolis Education Commission, and lifetime member of the Maryland uh, PTA. Um, but I'm not here on capacity of any official organization tonight. I'm here on with my own views and hopefully speaking for a number of the um, parents who can't speak to you because they maybe don't know how to negotiate the bureaucracy uh, quite as well. Um, I want to talk to you about a school that my kids have never attended. It's Tyler Heights Elementary. And when Mr. Truffer and I and the Annapolis Education Commission met there uh, just recently, this September, we got to see the 13 portable classrooms that are operating outside the school where the entire second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade are taught all day long. As you know, none of those portable classrooms have bathrooms. So the students are uh, accompanied. The entire class comes in and spends 15 minutes per day going to the bathroom. Um, that's over an hour of instructional time per week that those students have lost. And by the way, those students are 50% English language learners um, the, of the school, is 50% English language learners, and 87% free and reduced meal students. So the students we're trying to help most to close the achievement gap are getting incredibly shorted on their instructional time. In addition, because they're free and reduced meal um, recipients, they have to stand in line to receive their lunches. So many of the kids are not even getting time to eat their lunches because there's so many of them standing in line in this vastly overcrowded. It's at about 140% capacity now. Your own projections from this year's uh, Education Facilities Master Plan are projecting to go to 710 students, 160% capacity. It's just insane that these most vulnerable students are, have to deal with a facility like that. I'm aware that you have a proposal for redistricting. I'm going to be on that committee as well as some other Tyler Heights parents. But redistricting is not going to is a very you know harsh solution and is not going to solve the problem when you don't have capacity in the Annapolis system. So I'm urging you to look at the demographic change that happened in Annapolis between the 2000 and the 2010 census, where our population went from 6 point or 8 point percent. Um, Hispanic Latino to 17 percent in 2010 and it's probably close to 20 percent of Annapolis is Hispanic and Latino population now. We've had huge growth, 525 new students in that age group 
an entire elementary school's worth, and we need Tyler Heights to be rebuilt quicker than the schedule allows. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak during public comment on something other than the CIP and capital budget? I don't have any more cards. Okay, seeing none, we will now move on to the public hearing on the superintendent's recommended FY 2016 CIP and capital budget. This is a public hearing on the superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2016 CIP and capital budget. Those individuals wishing to testify have signed the sheet that I have before me. As the board wants to hear from everyone who has taken the time to be here tonight, three minutes will be allotted to each speaker. If you are here with a group wanting to speak on the same subject, I ask that you appoint a spokesperson to deliver testimony and other members of the group are welcome to stand while testimony is given. The light in front of me will flash yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining and a tone will be heard when your time is up. For the record, please give your name, the spelling of your name and the group you represent. Copies of comments are welcome and may be given to the board assistant. I will call individuals up in groups of five, if we have five. Please come up front and have a seat at the witness tables. You may speak from the podium or from the tables wherever you are more comfortable. This hearing is designed so that the board can obtain public input on the budget recommendation as opposed to a back and forth discussion. Board members will take what they hear tonight as well as other input received prior to this hearing and formulate their thoughts and questions about the budget, which will come up for adoption later tonight in this meeting. The sheet that I have before me currently just has one name, Jennifer Shane. Can you see me over the podium? <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, President Korbelak, uh, Superintendent Arlotto, and members of the Anne Arundel County Board of Education. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my strong opposition to the FY16 capital improvement budget. My name is Jennifer Chain, C-H-E-Y-N-E, -E, and I, am the, I have two children who will attend Edgewater Elementary School. As you may be aware, Edgewater recently celebrated its 60th anniversary. If you visited Edgewater, you would have noticed that not much has changed since the school was first built in 1953, at least facility-wise. Overcrowding at the school has led to the proliferation of portable trailer classrooms, relegating the entire fifth grade and ESL program outside of the main building. These trailer buildings recently covered the last available inch of blacktop at EES, severely limiting students' wet or damp day recess options. The oldest school in the county still serving a full-time student population as a primary learning center, you may be shocked to learn that the school does not have central air. At the beginning and end of the school year, the gym regularly reaches temperatures above the mid-80s, rendering it unusable. The heat and AC are, are so poorly regulated, students regularly sit in classrooms during the day wearing their coats, hardly an acceptable learning environment. As unbelievable as the overcrowding and HVAC situation at Edgewater is, the conditions get worse. The water quality at Edgewater is so poor that the students cannot drink the water. The water fountains have been rendered inoperable for student safety. Let me repeat this one more time. The water at Edgewater Elementary is not potable. It is unconscionable to me as a parent, taxpayer, believer and supporter of public education that Anne Arundel County Public Schools would allow such substandard third world conditions to persist, especially when the board has funded new schools for Davidsonville, Mayo, and most recently Annapolis Elementary Schools. Two years ago, Superintendent Maxwell promised the parents of Edgewater a feasibility study in the FY16 capital improvement plan. Superintendent Arlotto, we have waited patiently and again, AACPS has failed to deliver on that promise. If after listening to what I've described here, if you can still vote on a capital improvement budget without funding for at least a feasibility study for Edgewater, then either you have not listened or you've never visited Edgewater Elementary. The residents of Edgewater deserve better. The faculty and administration deserve better. And most importantly, the 512 students of Edgewater Elementary deserve better. I urge a no vote. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other names for the public budget hearing. So we'll move on to action items. Item 5.04, 
is an information to action item. Do I have a motion to move this from information to action? All those in favor? We now have an action item. Dr. Arlato, your recommendation, please. Got to make sure I'm on the right page. Thank you. I recommend approval of option C, revitalization for Manor View Elementary School. And we have a presentation on this item. Good evening. For the record, I'm Alex Shack, the Chief Operating Officer here for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, and I'd like to take a brief moment to allow the other members here before you to introduce themselves. The principal. Hi, I'm Barry Gruber, the principal at Manor View Elementary School. Lisa Seaman Crawford, Director of Facilities. Larry Albert, Supervisor of Planning, Design, and Construction. Ron Ilkovich, Architects, Small and Emerald Ilkovich Architects. And as the board is aware, uh, when we go about undertaking uh, a review of how our project's going to be discharged uh, once it enters into the capital program, the beginning phase is the feasibility study. It's locally funded only, and essentially it creates uh, a validation of the project and takes a look at five uh, different levels of how we will go about handling the project. Everything from the do-nothing option all the way up to the full replacement. Uh, the product here will be uh, asked to be voted on tonight uh, at the conclusion of a presentation so that it can be remitted to the State Board. As the Board knows, and again later this evening, we'll be uh, taking a look at the entire capital budget. Uh, it is uh, time sensitive in that we want these deliverables all to go up to uh, Baltimore before October so the State can take our entire capital budget into concert. With that, I'll turn it over to the members of the team to walk you through the report this evening. Before I uh, briefly describe the options, if we turn to page four, it lists the Feasibility Study Committee and Design Team for Manor View Elementary School. The committee and the design team have worked diligently to evaluate the educational specifications and how they compare to their school, discuss options, analyze floor plans, and eventually vote on an option. And we thank the committee for their work. Now the options. We have the five options, as Alex stated, the do nothing, which is exactly what it is. We don't do anything. Patch and paint, it's a cosmetic improvement to freshen up the building. The option would not include any code upgrades, any systemic improvements like a new roof or any type of uh, HVAC work to the building. A revitalization is a renovation in addition, if capacity is required. The spaces within the building are compared to the ed spec and if they are within 10% of the program, the size of the spaces would remain the same. All EdSped program spaces are included in the renovation addition, along with code upgrades, HVAC, and other systemic replacements and site improvements. Modernization is the same as revitalization, with the exception that all size requirements of the educational specifications are met. This option includes code upgrades, systemic replacement, and site improvements also. The replacement option is our prototype elementary school that you've seen in many schools in the past, Lothian, Rolling Knolls. Um, moving on to page 10, which is our summary sheet, and where we look, where each option has their um, square footage, the duration, the cost, and the 40-year cycle, life cycle cost. I'll come back to that page after Larry walks you through the current conditions and the revitalization and modernization and replacement options. Good evening. The, uh, on Manor View, if you go to page 24 in your book, it'll give you the site plan. We can start with that. Manor View was built in 1971. It's similar in model to Hilltop, Brock, Brockbridge, Bodkin. <laughs> Somebody's up there. Um, and it fa the school faces MacArthur on post. The parking is on the, we're fading in now. Parking, the main parking lot is to the uh, west, on, at least on the left side of the plan as you're looking at it. There's a small bus loop in front, and the majority of the parent drop-off takes place in that large parking lot onto the side. There's fields, obviously, behind multi-purpose and ball fields. The uh, 
No ADA access, however, in the school. This is one of those that we haven't done anything. And the school is still an open space school. Uh, on page 25, they are, as you can see, it's open space on all those. The large yellow area is the media center, which sits right smack in the middle of a hallway in the middle of the school. So every time somebody is trying to get from one end of the building to the other, they're walking through what is traditionally a quiet area. The, um, it has six pods around, so scattered around the building, but again, they're all open space. The classrooms in this particular building are oversized, but all the core spaces are undersized. So what we actually need is more gym, more media, more art, more administrative spaces. We don't actually need more classroom space. One thing to remember about Manaview as well is they do not have pre-K, K. That's being held at West Mead. So when you're going through this, you're only going to see grades one through five, which is another reason this school has additional space. Uh, if you go to page 54, I'll walk you through the revitalization. I can find it myself. And you will, because of this, the nature of this school, you're going to the modernization and the, and the uh, revitalization are going to look similar. There's some small differences. But again, part of the things we're trying to do is we've increased the bus loop. They've moved it over to the side of the school. The parent drop-off has been moved to the front of the school, so the children from both the buses and the parent drop-off can uh, immediately access the front door. The main parking lot is off still to the one side, but it's been reconfigured and approximately 20 spaces added to that to get the capacity up on that part of the building. The, it still has the multi-purpose field in the back and the ball field on the um, right-hand side of the project. If you go to the next page, page 55, they, uh, we will be adding, of course, obviously walls and doors throughout the facility in the open pod area. Oops, there we go. So those are, they'll all be divided, it'll be, again, grade one through five. Because we don't have pre-K, K, we actually have an extra space of pot for moving things. We're going to move the media center. We're proposing to move into one of those pods. It'll be quieter. It'll get it off of the central route. The former media center, we're proposing to, at this time, to take basically remove the roof and make it an open courtyard. It'd be an enclosed open courtyard. But it would be a place, uh, a lot of the courtyards get used for instructional learning. Uh, this would be a quiet place, a secure place, because it'd have walls on all four sides. And because it happens to be in the middle of this particular case, there are no classrooms that will be adjacent to it. Uh, sometimes we've had complaints in the courtyards that people can hear the kids talking or playing or whatever they're doing in the courtyard. In this case, it happens to be a nice isolated area. Uh, we would bump up the administrative area, which is in the front, to get the proper size health rooms, offices. Uh, art, science would be brought back into the school. There's currently, no, I don't believe, a science room in there. And music rooms would actually be upgraded. They're pretty tiny out there. Uh, the cafeteria is pretty close to the correct size, so the main addition in the front would be for, to increase the um, uh, gymnasium. Before and after care space uh, is not provided because the post does have their own before and after care space, but the gym is being increased to the full 6,000 with the community space in it because the post does use those activities. Uh, page 66. The site plan, we're going to go real quick just because it's pretty much the same as, the, uh, as it was for the revitalization. Page 67, though, on the floor plan, it, again, it's very similar, but there's some minor adjustments to be made. Uh, hallway is brought through the center of the building a little bit because we can move things around a little more. Remember, under revitalization, we're trying to also save as much of the structure as we can. So that's, again, the floor plans are very similar. Uh, it does take a little longer to do all this, though, because of the nature of w how we're interrupting things on the school. Sorry, no uh, in all of these plans, too, you'll also see that there is a, uh, the secure vestibule we put in all the schools. So we are meeting all those requirements as well. And then the last option is the replacement school, which is on page 82. At least the site plan is. And in order to uh, keep the children in Manorview Elementary, we would actually be building a replacement school where the current parking lot is. 
it does change the entrance to the school. It no longer faces MacArthur, which is one of the things that the other plans do. Uh, the bus loop is brought in, there's a parent drop-off bought around, and the parking lot is brought in the front. We didn't include a, site, a building plan because we figured everybody pretty much knows what the prototype is. This is the only scheme, though, of the three that is two-story, and it's also the only one that would be, have to be LEED certified because it would be a brand new facility. And with that, I will turn it back to Lisa. We'll head back to page 10 for our, our uh, executive summary. And there we list our options, how much square footage would be in each um, option, the duration, and the cost, the total cost, and the 40-year life cycle cost. Um, the committee uh, voted on a recommendation, and they selected revitalization. They liked the single-story school, the enclosed courtyard, uh, and the sh shorter duration of the project. So that concludes our presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Mrs. Birch. So I know with the revitalization versus the modernization, we don't completely get to our ed specs. And I know that one of the big differences between them then is no bathrooms in the classrooms. And so I know that we had talked about this when, when I was visiting the school, but I just want to ask again. So the committee didn't have a problem with not getting that that bonus that all the other schools have now, which is having a bathroom right in the classroom for their students. That was not an issue for, for the committee. Correct. The, the committee thought that having bathrooms in all of the classrooms would be a negative effect. We like the idea of having sort of a group bathroom by grade level for privacy reasons, and if multiple students need to use a restroom at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Ritchie? I just, uh, that courtyard caught my eye because Manor View being one of those schools is, it's a lovely little school, but it's very dark, and very dank in there. And so, you know, I mean, because of when it was built, no, no reflection on the school. Is that a, you're putting a um, skylight, is that what they're putting in there? No, it, it wouldn't be in a. It'd be uncovered. I, well, what does that mean? No roof. How's that? Be open to the sky. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so what I'm, oh, I was, no, I was just thinking then, so you're going to build walls all up around it. You're going to build, you're going to, so you have a big square, and in the middle of the square, you're going to have an open area. Yes. Oh, okay. Sort of like Jacobsville, a little bit. Uh, but, I mean, that's got the wall. Yeah, like Jacobsville right or Piney Orchard. Piney, both, okay. both of the same plan, yes. They yeah. have two little enclosed courtyards, yes. Okay, because uh, I'm thinking, well, how are you going to do that if you're going to have a, yes. so you're going to have an open area, completely open area. Completely open. There'll be but stuff walls around, around. Ah. yes. And also, it reminds me, in the revitalization and the modernization, all those open pod schools didn't have windows. We will be putting windows in all the classrooms. So <laughs> they will get that out of there too. Mr. Jackson. Just one question on the fire lane. <clears throat> of past, we have talked about making sure fire lanes went all the way around the school. In the revitalization plan it, on the north side, um, it only really goes to the first or second, or actually to the second corner. Why do we draw it that way when all the years past we have talked about making sure fire engines could get around our schools for emergency purposes? The fire marshal requires that we can have a 300 foot hose pole to any point on a building so that we can get a fire truck to within that point. Um, as you'll note, there's a bus loop with a fire lane that spurs off of it. We're allowed 150 feet before we need a turnaround to develop that. And on the other side, we have a service road and permit a turnaround on that hard surface play area. From those two locations, we can achieve the required hose pull required by code without the expense of pulling a fire lane completely around the entire building. So there's a cost savings just with the arrangement that we have here. So we actually don't have a requirement to go. There's next a requirement to, to access the entire facade of the building within a certain distance of hose poles. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Is there any public comment on this? Okay. There's a motion on the floor that's been properly made and seconded. All those in favor? Motion passes, 7-0-0. Item 5.05. High Point Elementary. Mm -hmm. I did. 
<laughs> this is an information to action item as well. Is there a motion to move this item from information to action? We now have an action item. Dr. Olato, your recommendation, please. I recommend approval of option D, modernization for High Point Elementary School. And I know we have a presentation. Yes, ma'am. Again, for the record, Alice Shaknovich, Chief Operating Officer, and let us allow us to uh, introduce ourselves to the record once again. Good evening, Timothy Merritt, Principal High Point Elementary School. Lisa Seaman Crawford, Director of Facilities. Larry Albert, Supervisor of Planning, Design, and Construction. And Ron Ilkovich, Small and Emerald Ilkovich Architect. And again, we ask your uh, indulgence as we walk you through the feasibility study. It is aligned uh, thematically like the one that was just presented uh, before. So once we walk you through the details, we'll be prepared to answer any questions you might have. Okay, I'd like to turn to page four again and um, outline the committee members and the design team and thank them. I believe we do have some members in the audience and I appreciate them showing up to show their support. Since we've recently refreshed you about the options, I will just let you move on to the layout of um, each of the school and Larry will go through that. And that's this case, we'll start with page 26. I've got one over here. Um, High Point was constructed in 1975. There's a number of this model around as well. Uh, Broadneck Elementary School, Brooklyn Park Elementary, and Four Seasons are just three of the schools that are here. The High Point has some unique challenges in that the site itself is an interesting shape. Um, it's not quite square, or it's not triangular, it's something else. It's very close, the school is very close to the street, uh, which limits the amount of room we can have for bus stacking. Parent drop-off is off to the side of the school, and the students need to either walk all the way around the school or slip in the back door. Uh, anybody visiting has got, the, got to come all the way around to the front of the building as well. The fields are scattered on the site. They're not really close to the gymnasium. And uh, just generally, there's a lot of awkward relationships in the facility. Again, there's no ADA access. And one of the big issues here is uh, on the left side of the page there where the parking lot is, that's a two-story building. But the lower story is at grade. And the rest of the school where the media and the cafeteria are a higher grade. So you actually have to go uphill to get into the school from the parking lot, which is not the, again, ADA access is pretty limited. Uh, if you go to the next page, page 27, uh, again, these are just like some of the others. It's an open space school. There are columns uh, located on a very regular 20 foot grid. So, um, I got the wrong page up. Is that the right one? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. I got lost. So the columns end up showing up in the middle of the classroom. You're right, I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, columns are located sometimes in the middle of the classroom. Again, the media center just happens to be in a wide open space in the middle of the school with lots of noise and commotion. And every time you want to go from a classroom to the admin, to the cafeteria, to the science labs, you have to run through this little space, which also causes problems. Uh, Classrooms, again, this is open space school. It's two stories. There's no windows, no walls, no doors. If we can go to page 56. This is the revitalization option that they're looked at. Um, again, remember, with the revitalization, we're trying to save as much of the facility as we can, as long as it's within a certain amount of 10% of the square footage that's in the ed spec. And in order to uh, increase the parking, we have moved, the, we've kept one parking lot on the uh, roughly where it was before on the lower left side of the drawing. We have moved the bus loop though to off of the side street, um, I believe it's Central Avenue. And that will help provide more space for the buses, not only on the lot, but they can also have a little more room to stack instead of stacking on the middle of Duval Way, which is what they do normally, or Duval Highway rather. Uh, because the site's a little awkward, to, in order to get the parent drop off, we've actually had to come off the main part of the community in the back of the road neighborhood, off that little circle. The main additions you can see outlined are primarily on the left, in the top of the floor plan that you're looking at, as well as on the right-hand side, just to get you oriented. And if you go to page 57, if you want to try, that's going to be the first floor plan. 
because again, remember this school has actually three floors. To the left is the lower level of the current two-story wing uh, with an addition that adds um, with seven kindergarten, uh, early childhood classrooms. So we've kept kindergarten on the ground floor, but again, you've seen an awful lot of hallways, corridors, not the easiest thing to manage. Uh, you would come up a half a flight of stairs. The media center stays more or less where it is, but we would provide walls. Um, there would be the um, arts and sciences on the north side of the building. And in order to expand the gymnasium to get it up to the right size, because it's relatively small, we actually would expand the building uh, out to the east there and get proper sized gymnasium. The school has both before and after care and the ex um, expanded gym area. Admin stays up toward the front of the school. Because we're expanding around the two-story building, there would, pro there would be no uh, ability to add windows to those classrooms. So those classrooms in the center would stay without windows. Maybe a couple of them get them, but that's about it. Uh, the entrance to the school, by the way, we have flipped. I've kind of, I was kind of indicating maybe it was bottom. It's actually the top. If you look at the large set of stair kind of lines that are closely drawn at the top, that's actually the admin and the main entrance to the school. So we flipped the site of the school site. I apologize for not mentioning it earlier. Uh, on page 58 is the two story. The second story, it's pretty much laid out the same as the lower level. Again, some ability to add windows to the outside, but not a lot. A lot of hallways, a lot of places for people to, to hide. Uh, page 66 is the modernization. And once again, we've flipped the school's main entrance to the back of the school. Excuse me, to the left side, get the right drawing here. I'm looking at two different pieces, I apologize. To the left side, we provide a new bus loop to that side of the school off of Duval Highway. The parent drop-off and the main parking is behind that. Uh, that actually gets all the parking entrances off to the main in front of the building. The f admin area that's uh, where that main entrance is, that's where the current two-story addition is. And in this plan, we actually remove that part of the addition. The main addition we're going to add is the area up on the top there where it says courtyard. And we'll be adding space to the right-hand side where it says gym. If we go to the next page, 67, you can see the end result. Uh, we could build the classroom addition that's on the top of the page. This also has an open courtyard, as we talked before. Again, to provide a secure area for instruction. You come down to the main part of the building where the yellow is, that would be the media center. The other core areas are going to be wrapped around that. Cafeteria would be off to the right, basically flipping where the, from the current gym, and the gym would be expanded to get to the proper size. Admin is on the light uh, tan area to the left side of the page. Both these plans, of course, we'd have uh, walls doors put in, natural light as much as we, uh, in this case, all the rooms would have, be able to get natural light because they're all going to be either on the exterior of the building or off the courtyard. Uh, they also get individual toilet rooms. We had the discussion previously, this one gets all the toilet rooms. So un under this modernization scheme. Uh, page 82 is our replacement school. And again, we basically just going to go look at the site plan because of the layout. In order to keep the school functioning while we're trying to operate, or at least attempt to do that, the new school would be tucked over to one side. It'd be relatively close to the two side roads. The main entrance is on the right there with a little red arrow. Uh, but it's pretty tight, so we're not quite sure you could have to keep the kids in the building, just as a head, heads up. Bus loop is brought in. We have parent drop off and parking that actually comes off of Central Avenue and the fields are a little bit more remote from the gymnasium in this particular one. The, the closest one's the previous one, the modernization. And I'll let Lisa finish this up. Okay, we'll go back to page 10 where we have the executive summary. And once again, it gives all of our options, the cost, the duration, and the life cycle cost. The committee's recommendation is a modernization. And do remember when they vote, uh, the committee does not have the benefit of the cost estimates. 
But unlike the previous feasibility study, the additional cost for the modernization provides many benefits. All classrooms would have natural light, either directly from the exterior or borrowed light from the courtyard, have less corridors, better sight lines, no longer a tri-level school, be no columns located in the middle of the classrooms, ease of construction because we could build that U-shaped classroom wing before we took down the existing classroom area, and um, the site layout is more efficient, <coughs> allows for more usable green space. The service area is located in the back of the building, and um, students would not have to be relocated to Chesapeake Bay Middle in this scheme. So that ends our presentation. Happy to answer questions. Mrs. Birch. Two quick ones. So when you said the ease of construction, is that why the modernization takes less time in this case than the revitalization? Because you can build that new section first? Okay. And the second question, and I could have asked it on the last one too. In the courtyard, what is a teaching platform? We, we talked about a number of opportunities for teaching opportunities in there. And they're not necessarily in the ed spec or in the ed spec yet, um, but we had a lot of exciting ideas with both committees, whether it be a platform with an amphitheater. Um, at Crofton Elementary School, for example, the music teacher has taken over that courtyard for music instruction outdoors. Okay. So there's all kinds of opportunities that we would explore during design for, for okay. learning opportunities. All right, thank you. Mrs. Ritchie? My question really has to do with the way we're changing the transportation into the into the school. And on the one, I think you were bringing people from a community through a community that they would not have normally gone through before, and bringing them in. So, have we looked at all the potential angst that that will cause for the community and that, that they're coming through? And have we had any discussions because some people are concerned about the increased amount of traffic, especially if it's at a dead end road? We've had some issues with those. So. Um, is that yes ma'am during the committee process the community entrance particularly on the revitalization problem is very problematic and, and you'll note that it is indicated as a con a substantial con um, a great number of these side roads are one lane in each direction don't really offer the opportunity for a bus to traverse safely um, unfortunately with the revitalization uh, definition it became the only option for that the only location we could bring the adequate bus loop size into the site um, without demolishing piece of the building, which is the next step in the evolution towards modernization. So uh, unfortunately, it's not a great solution in the revitalization, but really showed itself as a con during the, during the process. But fortunately, uh, Matt, Ms. Ritchie, the superintendent's recommendation is modernization. Right, right. And if you take a look at that site plan, it is far less impactful to any of the surrounding uh, communities and neighborhoods. It won't be encouraging that volume of traffic to the communities that exist uh, behind really their life will change little little to what it is today okay, well I mean so. I, anytime we do anything like that where we deviate from the norm mm -hmm. and the norm is all that traffic there and everybody knows all that traffic there and then we we change it you know I just want to make sure that we have thought ahead as opposed to waiting until we're in the middle of it and then people coming down here and asking us to change plans that you know we're in the middle of we yes ma'am and so. as, as as Alex noted, the, the bus entrance remains off Duval, which is a much w wider way on the modernization plan. Well, and I was talking mainly about the parent drop-off loop because that was the issue. I mean, I was I, the bus one was okay, but the parent drop-off piece was. Mm -hmm. yes, it, it's the same as the existing, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. The, the modernization. The, if, I couldn't if, see it. You know, I if you compare see. page 26 in your book uh -huh. uh, to the site plan for modernization, you'll see that the traffic access points are all the same. Okay. So where the side of the building the road that the parents use for parent drop-off post construction would remain the same okay. as they do pre so again those two align the best to existing conditions and that's why I was able to state earlier that the modernization option would create the least amount of deviation for that existing community okay good mr. Webb thank you uh, Mr. Shatnovich, uh, you all do a wonderful job with the logistics and adapting to the various unusually shaped sites we have. I was wondering, um, have we ever looked at what economies we could realize if we had a holding school? You've mentioned before that some, some uh, districts have holding schools where they can move populations to get the job done as far as revitalization 
renovation or building new. And that's a way of doing things maybe a little faster, getting things done a little faster with a with a, not as much uh, impact on the the children and the staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, clearly I would love to have four or five or six empty buildings sitting around for me to, to do, but <laughs> I don't have that luxury unlike some other counties here in uh, Anne Arundel. Uh, we've not uh, had that that ability over time. We use all of our buildings to, the, to essentially the, their maximum capacity. Uh, we do have some space uh, opportunities such as at uh, Chesapeake Bay Middle School or at uh, Annapolis Middle School that we use a swing space while we're doing construction, uh, but it's limited. It's far less than ideal. And as I said, unfortunately, we don't have half a dozen vacant buildings sitting around uh, in our portfolio. Yeah, I'm just curious. Maybe we uh, might want to talk to one of those school districts that does have a holding school or holding schools to see if there are any economies to be realized over time. I don't really have to speak to them. <laughs> the economies are obvious. I mean, those are school districts that, that at one time had high populations. Their enrollments mm -hmm. declined. So, they, so, they so they take a look at Prince George's or other counties. Their enrollments declined. And as their enrollments decline, instead of demolishing or selling or turning over their buildings, they, that's how they accumulated a portfolio of vacant buildings. They okay. kept buildings during the decline. In this jurisdiction, we never really saw that population decline. We never got to the point of excess and closing buildings. The only building that we, uh, that we don't utilize is the small school at Galesville. Mm -hmm. um, so we never, you know, unlike some of our jurisdictions to the West, never saw those large population downdrafts that sort of emptied buildings, caused them to, to consolidate, caused them to sell or repurpose facilities. So the phenomenon that created that opportunity in some jurisdictions really never materialized here in Anne County throughout our, our brief course of history. Okay, thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, there's a motion on the floor that's been properly made and seconded. All those in favor? Motion passes 7-0-0. The next action item is 5.01, administrative personnel appointments. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson. Yeah, Mr. Shagnovich, before, before you leave, <clears throat> remind us uh, for the old Phoenix Annapolis, what are we using that space for now? Uh, for the record, Alex Shagnovich, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, we are currently in a process of converting that space to be used for the performing visual arts magnet program shared by students from Annapolis High School, Broadneck High School, Bates Middle School, and Lindale. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm Brooklyn Park Middle School. Thank you. Mr. Webb. And if I'm not mistaken, the students came up with that cool name for it too. Yeah, there's, there's some symbolism there. They haven't told me what it is yet, but. Okay, attend to item 5.01, administrative personnel appointments. Dr. Alato, your recommendation, please. Yes, ma'am. I recommend that the personnel listed on the attached sheet be promoted and or appointed. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes 700. Item 5.02, superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2016 capital budget six-year plan and state capital improvement plan. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation, please. Yes, ma'am. I recommend that the Board of Education adopt uh, fiscal year 2016 capital budget, six-year plan, and state capital improvement plan. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Birch. I, I'm sorry that Ms. Um, Chain, I believe it was, left because I... I was just going to say that um, although the project that she mentioned um, is on the six-year plan for 2018 and it was on the plan for 2016 two years ago it's not because we moved it it's because it wasn't funded and we've continued to put it on each year it's just been moved each year because it wasn't funded and I wanted to make that clear to anyone in the audience or anybody watching that it's not that the Board of Education hasn't wanted a feasible feasibility study for 
Edgewater Elementary, it's that it's still in the same place in line that it has been in line um, for many years. And when we get the funding for the projects in order, it will be funded in the order that we've had it in for all the years. And Tyler Heights, which was mentioned earlier, um, is actually after Edgewater on our list. So with their second, third, fourth, and fifth grade in portables, they're still after Edgewater. So. Okay, I just wanted to mention, I know all the Crofton High School people left as well. Okay, hi, then I'll talk to you. <laughs> I, I asked for some numbers just to look at the capacity in 2020, which is our, six years out from now, and then 2023, as you all have brought forth. And in 2020, we still have a net total of 934 vacant high school seats in our county. And but by 2023, that number shifts and we have an additional 838, high, a need for an additional 838 high school seats throughout the county. So looking at this plan going six years out, it's just a teeny bit premature to be addressing capacity in the county when we're gonna have 934 vacant seats. I think the responsible thing to do in 2015 is to commission an updated facility study. Um, and I would like that study to take a look at the projected construction and enrollment and also where we have vacant land in the county so that we can be prepared in 2016 or 17 to put this additional space on the list. So that's just the numbers that I've, as I've looked at six years out, just a little bit premature, but getting there. Okay, no more comments or questions. We have a motion on the floor that's been properly made and seconded. All those in favor? Motion passes 700. Mrs. Ritchie. I would like to move that the staff develop a timeline for developing a process of a new feasibility study. The timeline will begin no later than November 5th um, at the board meeting to be presented then. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I want to just speak to that real quickly. Um, just to make it clear, not the process, it's a timeline on the process. Not it's so that we can start laying out, uh, there's been a lot of questions, there's been a lot of angst back and forth, MGT study, you know, yada, yada, yada. So what we need to do is be able to say, this is where we are and this is where we plan to go and, and how, how long it's gonna take us to get there. So that's what uh, the, the process is that I'm looking for is a timeline of how we're going to move forward not necessarily that the process will start on November the 5th. Dr. Arlotto. Thank you, Ms. Ritchie. Uh, we're glad to, to bring that to you. I wanted to clarify, thank you for clarifying that last point. The beginning of the motion was that the process, that, that you'd say the process would begin on the, on the 5th, when then you clarified at the end. So that's the reason I pressed the button to, to speak. So it's that we'll present a timeline to you on the 5th, of, on the 5th and we'll spell out when we'll begin the process at that from that point beyond including any steps that make excuse me, including any steps that will lead up so for instance if there's discussions that have to be had by some then that will be in there we're going to start discussions here we're going to put an rfb out of here we're not going to put whatever you know whatever the thing is going to be so that we have a clear understanding because it, it's hard to answer questions we keep hearing we're going to do it we're going to do it well we need to just have an idea of when it's going to happen and i think that that will help to um, calm some waters Okay, we have a motion on the floor that's been properly made and seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion passes 6-1-0. <laughs> Item 5.03, appointment of ethics panel member. This is an action item. And I guess we need a board recommendation. Mr. Jackson. Yeah, I'd like to recommend that Kia Chandler be appointed to the school board ethics panel to fill the vacancy of the term ending on June 30th, 2015. Ms. Chandler would be would then be eligible for reappointment to a three-year term commencing on July 1st, 2015. Is there any discussion? 
Is there any public comment? There's a motion on the floor that's been properly made and seconded. All those in favor? Motion passes 700. Congratulations. We now have a review item 6.01, a strategic plan update on community engagement. And we have a presentation. Good evening for the record. My name is Anthony Olson. I'm the Executive Director of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement. And I'm Teresa Tudor, Senior Manager of School and Family Partnerships. Um, as you're aware, in our strategic plan indicator, by indicator 14, by the final year of the strategic plan indicator, 90% of students, excuse me, of parents, will indicate that they are satisfied with the academic preparation of their students. And that is not a new goal in our strategic plan. In fact, that was also a goal, similar goal, in our 2007 to 2012 strategic plan indicator. During the past four years, Anne Arundel County Public Schools has participated in the statewide Maryland Safe and Supportive Schools MDS3 initiative. The MDS3 initiative was supported through a grant awarded to the Maryland State Department of Education, MSDE, by the Office of Safe and Drug-Free Schools at the United States Department of Education. The initiative was funded to develop a sustainable statewide system to measure school climate, also known as the conditions for learning, defined by the United States Department of Education as school environment, school engagement, and school safety. MDS3 provided an online climate survey that was administered to students, parents, and staff at nine of our high schools and in 60 high schools statewide from the spring of 2011 and annually thereafter through the spring of 2014. The survey is a research-based measure developed by a team at Johns Hopkins University in collaboration with our state partners, MSDE, and Shepherd Pratt Health Services. The survey items were derived from the previous published and validated measures. This year, Anne Arundel County Public Schools has combined this climate survey with both our annual bullying survey and our community engagement survey into one instrument will allow us to assess our goal established for the strategic plan indicator. This new survey will be administered annually between November and December to students in grades 3 through 11, school staff and parents district-wide. The survey collects information about perceptions of the school environment, is completed online, takes about 20 minutes for staff and 10 minutes for parents, is anonymous and voluntary. The survey is designed to learn more about what students, parents, and staff think about the school and how they can help improve the school environment. The information from the survey results will inform the school community about the level of satisfaction with the academic preparation of their children and perceptions of school climate, that is, feelings about safety, relationships, and the learning environment of a school. Research tells us that schools with positive school climates create the conditions for learning, thereby creating better places for students to learn and for staff to work. How are we going to get the word out? We're going to do many things. We're going to attend principal and cluster meetings to share information about the survey. Posters will go to all schools to be placed in the lobby and other areas that parents frequent. Connect Ed messages will be sent to all employees and all parents about the survey and how to access it, access it as well as a press release. One page documents about the survey will go home in all weekly packets to parents stressing the survey and its importance to their school, as well as information about the survey in the school newsletter. We will work with CRASC to discuss the importance with students 
and the importance of them taking the survey seriously and, and them understanding the real purpose of the survey. We're going to utilize bilingual facilitators to get the word out to all international parents on the importance of completing the survey. The survey will also be translated in Spanish. That's already been done. We'll present information about the survey to countywide parent groups, PIAC, CAC, and PTA. And we'll ask them to then send the information out to all of their contacts. We're going to do segments on AACPS cable TV shows about the survey and its importance. This will be done in three places, the Digest, Parents Corner, and Parent Connection. We're also going to develop a document for principals that's called Creative Ideas to Increase Participation. And then we'll send actual information to them about the survey that can go into school newsletters and staff communications. We're opening computer labs during parent-teacher conferences so that any parent while they're there for the conference can take the survey right there to make it accessible. And also for those parents who actually don't have technology in their home, they'll be able to come to the school and take the survey. We are very ambitious in our participation goal. We are hoping for 100% staff, 80% of students, and 30% of parents to complete the survey. That's our goal. I just want to talk very briefly about Indicator 13, which is 100% of schools will host a minimum of two activities, meetings, parent-teacher conferences, or other events in the community. And we want to let you know how well we are doing so far this year. We are not even to the end of September. We already have Glen Burnie, the Glen Burnie feeder, the Mead feeder, Part of the North County feeder and the Arundel feeder have had back to school expos that have included community partners. They've been day events for the community, family, all kinds of activities, face painting, free food, everything was free at all of the events. And all principals or staff members from schools were there to greet all of the parents and students before school even started just letting them to know how excited we were for the school year and wanting them to be able to ask any questions that they wanted in a non-threatening situation. It was great. Those are just four of the events that we participated with and community partners participated with, but many schools had back to school picnics in different locations. Fort Meade hosted several. So they are really, schools have embraced this and are taking it very seriously. We've had two community partners that have seen what's happened and have con already connected with us to ask us to start in two new clusters next year as well. So we're looking forward to that to continue. Thank you, and we'll take any questions. Mrs. Ritchie. Um, I like that you're ambitious with the... We are ambitious. <laughs> with your survey, and so the challenge to the parents is, if we come in at 30%, I will be so disappointed. I mean, come on. It's 10 minutes to click on a computer to take some questions. It, you know, I mean, parents really step up to the plate, and let's... let's um, you know, jump up there as well. because And it will be accessible yeah. on your smartphone. We do have the version that, so you will be able to read it on your smartphone as well. And, and yeah, so I mean, it's not, it should be, you know, that's not too difficult to, to ask, to find out, because we really do take these surveys seriously. Um, you know, I mean, we do look at the information, and that's how we've been able to build a lot of the programs that we've built and the outreach that we have done through the school system. You know, I mean, if you think back 20 years ago, if you didn't come to the school, you didn't get anything. And so now we're really doing a lot of outreach and, and so forth. And so um, it's time for them to, to give feedback. A question on the survey is, is it just going to be, a, uh, you have, is there going to be an ability to, to write like concerns or, you know, because sometimes when you're filling out the things, you fit in one piece, but you, and you, a little bit in the other piece, you want to be able to clarify it. Is there any, that going to be on there? I do know. Yes, there are opportunities that you can, I'm uh, glad he comments. knew that. I did not think there yeah. was. <laughs> well, that's Thanks. good. I mean, and I'm not Thanks. encouraging people to write how horrible things are, but but if there's an issue where you kind of fall in between, I mean, if, if you think got something that's really horrible, you should not be putting it on a survey. You should actually be calling somebody and, and discussing things. But, you know, I mean, but there's sometimes that something fits a little bit, not, not quite, so that's great. Well, yeah, I'm really glad Anthony knew that because before we did it when we created our own, but originally the 
that survey didn't originally do that. And we have worked with the partners, and they made lots of adjustments to it. This, it used to not be translated as well. And so we've really worked well, and we can't say enough about how wonderful they've been to work with. And I know that uh, usually okay. during your um, parent involvement conference that's coming up, in November, November 15th, 16th, I'll just give a plug that for Saturday, that right away. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you, we've 16th. always handed out paper copies and stuff like that, but we're really in, not going to do that. We're going to have, and we're going to work for that. So again, and, and one other thing to parents, and you may already have that out there to the schools is, you know, to make sure that they do have, encourage their PTAs to have a survey night, maybe, you know, get somebody to uh, donate some food and ask people to come in to do some survey nights and stuff like that so that you know we can encourage them. And it's also during, um, a little run during the time of parent-teacher conferences. conferences. So schools are able to have la um, computer labs open or uh, a, a kiosk available as well as during uh, National Education Week. Right. So looking at opportunities where parents are already in the building as well that they can piggyback on to have those opportunities for parents to complete the survey. So for all the parents that are watching the show, because I know you're all out there, <laughs> not watching America's Got Talent, but but watching this, make sure that you go and you do this because it really is it really is important and and we need to have that information and and get that right. We and you can know. take it from your home. You don't have to go into the school. It's just we are opening the schools to make it available there as well. Mrs. Birch. So when will the survey be available? November and December. Okay, so and December. so we we're encouraging everyone to do it, but it's not available now. No, so it's not slow available down. yet. We're just all informing right. you about it, and okay. now all of the all of the things that we mentioned that we're going to do, they're all in the process now. Okay. We're starting to get to all okay, of those. Okay, so it'll be November, and, and I want to thank you for everything that you're doing. I'm really so pleased and impressed, and I also want to thank you for us not doing the old survey anymore that we did every year, exactly the same when I went to parent-teacher conferences for five years in a row. I'm so glad it's we gone. very excited to have this new one. Thank We're you very, very much. Excited. <laughs> Mr. Webb. Thank you. Just want to make sure you give uh, the Annapolis Education Commission a heads up on this and also uh, the Housing Authority. I know they do have some facilities that people have access to with computers and that might be uh, facilitate some more participation in the, the survey. And I like that idea of having um, some of our parent groups also maybe go out in the community in some of those locations and have food, you know, have something down there because you can have your PTA events off school site. So that would be a really good opportunity. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Item 7.01, Award of Contract. This is an information to action item. Do I have a motion to move it from information to action? All those in favor? Dr. Oletto, your recommendation, please. Yes, ma'am. I recommend the Board of Education Award Contract Number 15-14CN-040-006, Engineering, Design, and Construction. Administrative services for generator replacement at Southern High School to Johnson, Mir Miraran, and Thompson in the amount of one hundred thousand seven hundred seventy dollars and sixty nine cents. Mm -mm. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. One hundred seven thousand seven hundred seventy dollars and sixty nine cents. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Any public comment? All those in favor? Motion passes, 700. Before we adjourn, I just have a couple of meeting announcements to share. The next Board of Education meeting is Wednesday, October 8th at 10 a.m. The next Board Policy Committee meeting is Wednesday, October 15th at 8.30 a.m. in the boardroom here. The next Board Budget Committee meeting is Tuesday, October 7th at 5 p.m. in Conference Room 2A on the second floor of this building. And the board will also be holding a community outreach event on Tuesday, October 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Village, Chap the Village of Wall Chapel Community Center in Gambrels. And, <laughs> and that concludes the meeting. Meeting adjourned.